heaven's throne you came to us and set your heart upon the cross we'll never know the sacrifice you made for all our sin and all our shame you took the nails you took our place no one else could do what you have done one name is higher one name is stronger than any grave than any throne Christ exalted over all from the grave where death would die you rose again brought us life you're reigning now the savior of the world you're reigning now the savior of the
I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. I'm gonna sing in the middle of a storm.
a God of covenant and faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven you'll do just what you said. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast and let my heart know when you speak a word, it will come to pass. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness to me. From the rising sun to the setting same, I will praise your name. Great is your faithfulness to me.
God, we just thank you for your faithfulness, um, that you're just for us every single day, that we can put our faith in you, God. We are just so thankful for your presence in this room right now, and we are so grateful that we're able to gather here together to just worship you and praise you and love you, God. We thank you so much for all the sacrifices that Jesus made for us, God, that he took our place. We thank you and we love you. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. Well, good morning, everybody here in the house, as well as those of you online. We're glad that you've joined us today, and we're in the conclusion of this series called Prove It, and it's a series from the letter of 1 John. So uh, let me start with a question. How do you know you know something? How do you know you know something? You prove it. And in fact, oftentimes you prove it by taking a test and passing that test. So if you want to get a driver's license, you have to prove that you know how to drive a car by taking a test. If you want to graduate from high school or college, you must prove that you've mastered some course of study over that time to receive a diploma, and you do that by passing a bunch of tests along the way. To become a firefighter or a police officer, You have to complete a course of study and you have to pass a test to show you know how to do that job. To become a doctor or anybody else in the medical profession, you have to complete a course of study and prove that you've mastered that knowledge by taking some tests along the way. But how do you prove that you know somebody? There's no test for that. To really know someone is to know more than their history. I bet you know some people's history, but you don't really know them. You can know a lot about somebody, but really not ever know them. To know someone is to know their priorities, to know their passions, to know what makes them tick. It means you've spent time listening to them, and you've delved into their lives below the surface. But what about knowing God? So throughout the letter of 1 John, the Apostle John, who's the author of this letter, tells us why he wrote the letter. So let me read it to you. I write, I have written to you who are God's children because you know the Father. I have written to you who are mature in the faith because you know Christ existed from the beginning. I have written to you who are young in the faith because you are strong. God's word lives in your hearts and you have won the battle with the evil one. And then John concludes this letter with with these words. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence you have in approaching God, that if you ask him, ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked of him. You see, John wants to impress upon his hearers, both then and now, that because we have faith in God, we not only have eternal life, but we know God. And if we know God, We can approach him because we can be in a relationship with him. Now, this is very similar. This is very similar to what Jesus said when he prayed to God the Father these very words. He said to God, now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. 
Now, speaking of those who believe in and follow Jesus, Jesus said this. He said, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. My sheep know me. So how do we know we know God? What is the evidence that we have so that we can be confident in our faith relationship with God? You know, John wrote down what he heard Jesus say when Jesus talked about the good shepherd, referring to himself. And Jesus has this great word picture about what a shepherd does. And when we read it, it makes so much sense about how we can relate to God. The shepherd knows the flock, and the sheep know the shepherd. And in fact, the sheep know the shepherd's voice, and the shepherd uses his voice to guide and to direct the sheep, and the sheep trust and follow the shepherd. And I haven't spent a lot of time around sheep, but my my grandparents were dairy farmers, and they ran a herd of milking cows, uh, over a hundred head, and my grandfather every morning would uh, milk the cows, and then afterwards, he would herd them out of the milking barn to the pasture that was filled with green, lush grass where they could graze and and obviously produce more milk. And then in the afternoon, he would go back to the pasture, and he would call out to the cows, And, and they would hear his voice, and they would come, and this is 50 acres or more of pasture, and they would just all come in because they knew when they came into the milking barn that they were going to be taken care of, and they were going to be fed, and they were going to be blessed. On a couple of occasions, more than a couple of occasions, my grandfather let me go out to herd the cows in with him uh, because it sounded like a fun thing to do, but you know what? When I called out to the cows, the cows didn't come toward me. They went away from me uh, because they didn't know me. They didn't trust my voice. So I, I think this idea of, of caring for animals helps us understand about how God cares for us because God is our caretaker. But, you know, there is a sort of an obvious disconnect with these word pictures of a good shepherd or, or my grandfather on his dairy farm. And it, it's sort of obvious that, that Jesus and God aren't physically here in a pasture with us. God isn't physically standing in our midst, calling out in an audible voice that we can hear. So how do we know God and how can we be assured of that knowledge? Well, we get to know God, the the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit through Scripture when we read about Him and about His nature. And when we read Scripture about God, we gain the knowledge that God is all-powerful and yet gentle, that God is gracious and yet He desires obedience, and that God is loving and, and yet, yes, wrathful. And, and obviously, there are many more characteristics of, about God. But, but if we're going to know God and walk in faith with God, we, we need to know more than having our heads just filled with the knowledge of what God is like. We can know God. We can know about God by what Scripture says about Him, but we really get to know God when we live according to what we've learned from Scripture, when we walk by faith and we experience God's faithfulness and His promise keeping to us from what we've learned in Scripture, we really get to know God. And that's really the emphasis that John pushes in his letter. He says, you can prove you have faith in God by walking in God's light by walking in righteousness, by walking in truth, by walking in love. And, and over the past four weeks, we've covered each one of those topics. And, and I would encourage you, if you missed those, to go to our website. You can stream those messages anytime. But today we're going to talk about what it means to know God and walk in faith. We will live out what we say we believe when we walk in faith. 
And, and the letter of John tells us what it looks like to know God. So first of all, he tells us this. He tells us, we know that we know God when we live out God's priorities. Listen to what John writes. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Keeping the commands that God gives us is evidence that we know God. It means that we know what he commanded are his priorities. God gave us those commands for our good. They were given to bless us, to benefit us, not to penalize us. Just, just take a moment here and, and just listen as I, I read the Ten Commandments. All right? You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image and worship them. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord. Remember the Sabbath by keeping it holy. Honor your father and mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not covet. Now, many people look at those commandments as rules. And they think that God is trying to kill their joy, to take the fun out of life. But, but look at them again. The, the first four tell us how to make our relationship with God a priority. They're relation-based. The last six tell us how to make our relationships with others a priority. They are relation-based. They're guardrails for our lives, not rules to beat us up. Now, the reality is that rules without relationship becomes legalism. According to scholars, there are 613 laws to be kept in the religion of Judaism. So Jesus called out the teachers of the law and the Pharisees for their legalism regarding God's commands. They were so obsessed with keeping every law to the nth degree that they even gave God a tithe, 10% of their gardens. Listen to what Jesus said. You hypocrites, for you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. When the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought a woman to Jesus that they said had been caught in an immoral situation, they posed a question to him. They said, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? Well, Jesus knew what the law of Moses said. In Deuteronomy, it says, if a man is found sleeping with another man's wife, both the man who slept with her and the woman must die. So the teachers of the law and the Pharisees were hoping to catch Jesus in a trap. If Jesus recommended that the woman be released, he would be accused of breaking God's laws, the laws that Moses had given them or taking them at least nonchalantly. On the other hand, if Jesus recommended stoning this woman, he would be breaking the Roman law, thus bringing down the wrath of the Roman government against Jerusalem. Justice would naturally also demand, in this case, something else. You see, the Jewish leaders cared nothing about true justice in this instance because it would naturally demand that both the adulterous man and the adulterous woman would be brought forth. But they didn't care about justice. They were trying to catch Jesus in a snare. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law kept on questioning Jesus until he finally stood up and said, 
Let the one of you who is without sin be the first one to throw a stone at her. Jesus' response flawlessly preserved both the Roman and Jewish law by uncovering the evil intentions of the hearts of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Now, hearing those words from Jesus, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, they dropped their stones and went away. And Jesus turned to the woman and asked her, had anyone condemned her? And when she said no, Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. You see, the the teachers of the law and the Pharisees thought the priority of God's law was about perfection. And so that's why they desired to keep it to the nth degree. And because they knew that wasn't how Jesus thought they should keep uh, the, the law, that there was something more important about the law, they set a trap for him. But Jesus knew the priority of God's law, that it wasn't about seeking perfection, that God's law was about reprioritizing humanity's relationship with God and with each other. In fact, Jesus said this. He made it very clear. He said, don't misunderstand why I have come. He said, I didn't come to abolish the law or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. You see, Jesus understood that the law was given to humanity to maintain God's priority of keeping relationships with him and with others in a right manner. God's priorities help us maintain good, healthy, and godly relationships with each other and with God. And there's a blessing that comes from keeping those commands. Look, when you're honoring your parents, not murdering, not committing adultery, not stealing or lying or desiring everybody else's stuff, you're going to maintain good relationships. And not only are you going to do that, you're not going to blow up your own life. You will know that you know God when you're living out his priorities, out of a relationship not out of a legalistic following of rules. You'll also know that when you live in God's passions. Late in the letter of 1 John, he writes, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. The biggest evidence that we know God is that we love others. We know what love looks like because God is love and because God has shown us even more so what love looks like in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. God is passionate about humans. That's why we have this long history of God never, ever giving up on us, pursuing us despite our disobedience, despite our faithful, faithlessness. Have you ever noticed that when Jesus was asked what the greatest command was, he never quotes one of the Ten Commandments? What he does quote is commonly known in Judaism as the Shema. The Shema says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And then he said there's a second like it, and he quoted from the book of the law of Leviticus, where it says, love your neighbor. Now, What Jesus said about these two commands points back to God's priorities. Jesus said this about those two laws. He said, the entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on those two commandments. Those two commandments, not the ten commandments. Those two commandments which aren't in the ten commandments. In other words, if you love God and love others, you're keeping all of God's commandments because loving God and loving others will make it clear to us what is right and wrong and then obviously we have to choose what is right 
It's interesting to note that in the Gospel of Mark, when he records this conversation about the greatest commandment, he tells us it's between Jesus and a teacher of the law. And after Jesus gives the teacher of the law his answer to love God and to love your neighbor, the teacher responds and he compliments Jesus, adding that loving God and loving your neighbor is more important than to offer all of the burnt offerings and sacrifices required in the law. That's amazing. This teacher of the law gets what God's passions are because he's saying loving God is more important than temple worship. And that was honestly the central focus of first century Judaism. It was temple worship, which is probably why they forgot about loving God and loving others. I think it's important too to note that When the command to love one's neighbor was given in the law of Moses, when it was in the book of Deuteronomy, many of God's people at that time misinterpreted what it meant to love your neighbor. They just thought it meant to love your fellow believer, you know, your your fellow follower of the laws of Moses. Not all people. Just the people that believed like them, that's who they defined as their neighbors. But Jesus helps us and then at that, them then at that time that God's passion is not just for a group of people, it's for all people. Once Jesus, once, once someone uh, who considered themselves to be an expert of the law of Moses asked Jesus how to inherit eternal life, and as he often did, Jesus flipped the script on this person by asking him a question instead of answering the question. And he asked this expert, what is written in God's law? How do you interpret it? The expert replied with the commands, love, the, love God and love your neighbor. And Jesus replied, you've given the right answer. If you do this, you will have eternal life. Now, getting a little uppity, this expert in the law asked Jesus, well, then who is my neighbor? A little philosophical question there. And that's when Jesus tells this radical story about a Jewish man being beaten up and robbed and left for dead on the side of the road. Now, if you've heard the story of the Good Samaritan, you just got to undo that. You got to understand how radical this was to his audience in first century Jerusalem. As he continues to tell the story, he shocks his audience when one Jewish leader after another sees this man beaten and robbed, a fellow Jew lying on the side of the road, and they don't bend down to help him. They actually move to the other side of the road to pass on by. And then the person that comes into view is someone from the region of Samaria. Now, we, we've got to undo something in our heads right now because when you hear Samaritan, you think, oh, that's a great person. If you were a first century Jew, that is not what you would have thought. You would have thought those people are evil. Those people are spiritual half-breeds. Those people are my enemy. I hate them. I will not go through their towns. I will go out of my way 10, 20 miles to get from point A to point B, just so I don't have to interact with those unclean, evil people. That's what first century Jews thought when they heard Samaritan. But that's who comes along and helps this beaten and robbed and nearly dead Jewish man. And Jesus said, that's who your neighbor is. Now, Calling a Samaritan a neighbor would be the last thing a Jewish person would ever do. Jesus is redefining then and now who his followers are supposed to love. He says one's neighbor is a Samaritan to this first century audience. And and that was, there were gasps when that was said. But think about what that means for us as it did then. It, It means Loving your neighbor includes loving the person you like and loving the person you don't like. 
It, it means loving your friends and loving your enemies. It means loving your fellow believer of your faith and loving people of other faiths. It, it means loving the person from your ethnic group and loving the people outside of your ethnic group. It means loving the person whose politics are like yours and loving the person whose politics are completely opposite of yours. Now, this matches up what Jesus said throughout the Gospels. He said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. He said, do good to those who hate you. Later on, the Apostle Paul would say this about the love your neighbor command. He said, the entire law, the law of Judaism, is fulfilled with this command to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Now, unfortunately, in recent years, Christians have seemed to forget how Jesus defined who our neighbors are. We've become more known for what political group or, pith, or people group or ethnic group that we stand against rather than the one that we stand for and his command to love all people. When we vil vilify and demonize other people, we are not doing what Jesus told us to do. We are not living in God's passions because God is passionate about all people. And God wants all people to know that he loves them. And guess what? He's chosen you and me to communicate that love by the words that we speak and the actions that we live out. That's God's passion. And that needs to be our passion. So you will know that you know God when you are living in God's passions. And lastly, you'll know that you know God when you live with God's presence. The last way John points out that we can know that we know God is when he writes this. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. So, you know, when, when someone decides to believe in Jesus and enter into a relationship of knowing God, God gives us his spirit to dwell with us, to dwell even in us, to be our teacher, our guide, our comforter, and a whole lot more. And the Bible uses words to describe that, like Jesus said that we would be born of the Spirit. Uh, he says the Spirit will live in us and, and that will be in us. Luke, who wrote the book of Acts and the Gospel of Luke, said we'll, we'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit, we'll be filled with the Spirit, we'll receive the Spirit, that the Spirit would fall on people. The prophet Joel said we would, that the Holy Spirit would be poured out on us. Don't get hung up about how the Holy Spirit enters your life. It does when you believe in Jesus. And the Holy Spirit is the presence of God in our lives to guide us, to teach us, to comfort us. Nothing to be afraid of about the Holy Spirit. But when you recognize the Spirit is living in you, that's when you begin to know that you know God, that God is living in you. And let me drill down into this a little bit. The Bible makes it clear that we know we have the Spirit by what happens in our lives. In fact, the Bible says when we have the Holy Spirit and live with and by the Spirit, will live in a way that demonstrates that reality. The Bible says that the Spirit will produce certain qualities that the Bible calls the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit are these qualities. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You're not going to be perfect in those areas, so don't, don't look for perfection. But when you begin to see those qualities welling up in your life, you're recognizing the Spirit is leading you and guiding you. When we're living with God's presence of the Spirit, we'll bear that fruit. And that's evidence that we're walking with and knowing God. But in that same passage where we read about the fruit of the Spirit, it also tells us what is clear evidence that we don't know God. We read this. When we follow the desires of our sinful nature... The results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outburst of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Taking into account what it means to live with God's presence through his spirit and producing the fruit of the Spirit, we see 
what it looks like to know God. The Apostle Paul wrote this. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to the cross and crucified them there. So if we know God, we will bear the fruit of the Spirit. It will come out of our lives. It will produce it. And we will have to crucify the desires of our sinful nature. So let me sort of bring this to a close. The Bible says this, that we should examine ourselves and see if our faith is genuine, that we need to test ourselves on our faith. So if you question whether you really know God, these are three things that will help you prove to yourself that you know him. If you're living out his priorities, if you're living in his passions, and if you recognize you're living with his presence, and, and I want to encourage you that the way to do that is to spend time taking in God's word more than you spend scrolling on your phone, more than you spend reading or drinking in or being discipled by the ways of the world through the media and everything else. You need to let God and the Holy Spirit make you a disciple. Read God's word. Listen to God's word. Find another follower of Christ to talk about what you're reading. Encourage one another. That's what we're supposed to do. And when we do that, we'll begin to see the evidence that we know God. We're going to move into a time this morning of celebrating the Lord's Supper. And uh, as we do so, uh, if you don't, didn't pick up uh, communion when you came in, just raise your hand and ushers will bring the communion to you. If you're with us online, we want to encourage you to get some bread and juice and uh, come on back and uh, we will celebrate the Lord's Supper together. So keep your hands high and they'll uh, bring those to you. I hear a couple of you, go ahead and you can go ahead and get those little uh, toppers started because they are not easy, uh, as we all know. This is a a, a fitting uh, segue from walking in faith with Jesus to celebrating the Lord's Supper. Because truly, the Bible tells us very clearly that only people who believe in and follow Jesus should celebrate the Lord's Supper. And the Bible actually tells us that there is a way to do it. And that way to do it is that we need to take it seriously and prepare ourselves. And to prepare ourselves, we do that by praying and confessing our sins. Those sins of commission things that we have done, and those sins of omission, things that we should have done that we didn't do. So what I would like to do is move into a time of prayer, and I would like to invite everybody at one point in this prayer to spend some time in silent confession. But I recognize that there may be somebody who's not yet a follower of Jesus in the room or joining us online, and I would like to give you the opportunity to start that relationship today. And I'm going to give you some words to speak, to pray, Uh, they're not special words except they indicate the condition of your heart that you want to believe in and follow Jesus. So I encourage you to pray them. And if you do, I want to encourage you by giving you some material, a book to help you grow in faith. So let us know so we can put that in your hands and help you grow. So if you would, here in the room and online, bow your heads and let me start off with a prayer for those who want to put their faith in Jesus. God, we thank you that you love us and you desire for each of us to know you and to follow you. And for that man or woman today who has never told you they believe in you and want to follow you, this is your opportunity to put these words in your own words and pray them silently back to God. So here you go. Dear God, I believe in Jesus. Go ahead and pray that to him. I believe that Jesus came to earth and died to pay for my sins. And I believe that Jesus rose again from the dead to defeat the power of sin and death. And today I declare that I believe in him and want to follow him all the days of my life. And then we say amen, but we'll stay in prayer. God, as we have gathered here today, as we we come to the table to celebrate the Lord's Supper, Lord, we ask that you would be with us 
and that you would hear our prayers as we confess to you our sins. So go ahead and silently pray and confess your sins to God. And we say amen to that prayer. The Bible says as far as the east is from the west, when we confess our sins, God removes those sins from us forever. So let me remind you of why we celebrate the Lord's Supper. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he was sitting around the table celebrating a festival meal and he took bread and he broke that bread and he gave it to the disciples and he said, take this and eat it in memory of me. So go ahead and eat the bread. After they had eaten the bread, he took the cup. He said, this cup represents my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Take this and drink it in memory of me. Go ahead and drink the In scripture, we have these words. They say, as often as we eat this bread and as often as we drink this cup, we proclaim the death of Jesus Christ on our behalf until he comes again. It's a statement of our faith. So as we bring this service to a close, before I give us the final blessing, I want to encourage you to make sure you know that you know God. See if his priorities are living in your life. If his passions are present in your life. If his presence is with you in your life. If you want to talk about that, if you want somebody to pray with you, there'll be prayer team members up here afterwards or you can send us a prayer request online. We would love to support you in prayer. I want to encourage those of you in the building to connect with one another in the cafe afterwards. Those of you online, we'd love to hear from you. Send us an email at connect at valleybrook.cc. Now let me close with a final blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of Jesus, amen. God bless you all. Have a great day.